Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to essentially what's going to be the last lecture of, of the course. Um, we might do some more um, talk teaching, you know, with, with a tutorial or whatever at some point, depending on, on what you guys want. Um, so to, to finish off, I'm really going to talk about, I mean, I mentioned before that mass transfer is, is probably the only subject that uh, is unique to chemical engineering. A lot of what chemical engineers do overlaps with what mechanical engineers do or what um, civil engineer, engineers do or what physical chemists do. So it's, um, it, and it actually evolved from industrial chemistry way back in the late 19th century. But the, the one subject really that not many other disciplines do, I can't think of any at the moment, is, is mass transfer. And mass transfer is extremely important for a traditional chemical engineer in terms of understanding process like distillation, where you're separating <coughs> mixtures of, of molecules on the basis of their, their volatility, or in liquid-liquid extract, extraction, where you're separating components on the basis of their, their solubility in another solvent. You know, where we, we also have mass transfer <coughs> in adsorption and chromatography columns, all sorts of places mass transfer is occurring both by convection and by diffusion. For example, in, in the, the drug whole area of, of drug delivery, diffusion would be an important idea in things like slow release uh, tablets, that kind of thing. So that, that would be an important application of, of diffusion. But by far, for, for biotech students, really by far the most important application of mass transfer is really the, the provision of oxygen to the bioreactors where you're growing cells of any type. It could be bacterial, it could be yeast, it could be mammalian cells, where you're growing them to produce some product and you're doing so under aerobic conditions. I mean, most, most reactions are, are bioprocess reactions will involve aeration at, to some degree. Um, so we have to have some sort of grasp of, of how to describe mass transfer in, in bioreactors, what kind of things affect the rate of mass transfer, um, the interaction between mass transfer to the liquid and the uptake of oxygen by uh, the, the cells themselves. So there's, there's a lot of things going on. Now, the last day I, I talked about this thing called the, the general theory of interfacial mass transfer which is sometimes called the Lewis Whitman um, theory of, of mass transfer across an interface. And it is quite complicated and it's, it's quite uh, abstract in many ways. And there are a number of ideas in there that you can't prove, but you kind of assume they're correct. And, and, by, and it turns out that they're a reasonable assumption, but there are a little few kind of leaps of faith you have to take in, in trying to get to grips with it. Now, one of the good things, I mean, Biological systems are often tricky to work with because we lack data and microbes tend to behave in slightly unpredictable ways compared to, to chemical systems. So in, in general, bioprocessing is more of a what we call a black art than, than chemical processing. And that makes it more difficult at times. I mean, if you look, say, at the, the metabolism of, of a, a bacterium and how that impacts on how it, it how well it grows and how the extent to which it produces product. They're very complex ideas. But one of the really good things about mass transfer in in bioreactors, which is essentially the mass transfer from air to water, mass transfer of oxygen from air to water, essentially, is that if you work through the in general theory of interfacial mass transfer, and you take account of the fact that oxygen is only sparingly soluble in water. It's, it's less than a percent, I forget. It's either 0.3 or 0.03 percent, I can't remember. But um, uh, water has a low capacity for dissolving oxygen. And if you work through the general theory of interfacial mass transfer, um, that lack of solubility means that the oxygen transfer of oxygen uh, from air into water is exactly the same as the mass transfer of a solute from a solid particle into water. So suppose you had a, the experiment you did in B272 where you had a, a little sweet and it was dissolving um, and you were able to describe the rate of mass transfer or the rate of dissolution of the particle as a mass transfer coefficient times 
the difference between the saturation concentration of the solute in the water minus the actual concentration of solute in the water. Um, well, I'm sorry, not the actual, the bulk concentration of, of solute in the water. And it turns out that the because of the low solubility of, of oxygen in water, the, that process, that um, scenario where you have oxygen concentration from the, the from air into water behaves exactly like um, the dissolution of a solid, a pure solid particle. So what it means then is, and a little bit of text there is that the rate of mass transfer um, or, or the key concentration difference for mass transfer on the liquid side is the concentration, the saturation concentration of um, oxygen in air, in water, in contact with air, minus the bulk concentration of the oxygen, which you would measure with a dissolved oxygen electrode. And this would be just, you would know this. So here we have then a little mass balance for um, the aeration of, of a tank of water, say, with, with, with air. And you would have done this in BE272. So this was your starting point. So on the left-hand side, this is this, the same kind of um, method that we use over and over again in, in our bioprocess engineering. You know, no matter what system we're looking at, we nearly always have to do some kind of mass balance, whether it's a uh, in unsteady state mass balance where we have to use calculus or whether it's a steady state balance where we don't have to use calculus. Um, and sometimes we have to do heat balance as well. But in, in biotech, it's normally just mass balances. So on the left hand side there, we have the liquid volume times the dissolved oxygen concentration. So that's the rate of accumulation of oxygen in the liquid phase. Um, KL times CL star minus CL is the mass flux. So this is our mass transfer coefficient and we're just denoting, giving it the subscript L to denote that this is all on the liquid side of the problem. What's happening on the gas side isn't very interesting. Um, and then our concentration difference is the saturation concentration um, of oxygen and water minus the bulk concentration. We're using a small K and if, you, and if you look back at the notes on interfacial mass transfer, technically this should be a large K if you look closely, it should be an overall mass transfer coefficient. But again, because of that solubility effect, then the overall and the liquid side mass transfer coefficient turn out to be identical. So anyway, that's just a little bit of, of background. So if KL into CL star minus CL is, is a flux, and remember a flux is always something per, per unit area, um, whether it's a heat flux or a mass flux or, or whatever. Um, so we have to multiply that by A. And A is the total area for mass transfer. So if you think of what's happening in a bioreactor, um, oxygen is, is essentially, or air is pumped into the bioreactor via a thing called a sparger. A sparger is just like a little horseshoe shaped metal um, ring with little holes in it for, where the oxygen, the air comes out. So the air comes out in the form of bubbles. So the A there, represents the total surface area um, of all the bubbles that are in the bioreactor at any given time. So that, that's a kind of a complicated parameter. I mean, you, if you look closely, and I hope you did this year in your, well, you wouldn't have been able to, but next year when you're in the third year lab and you can actually, we've, we've got glass bioreactors, so you can see the, the bubble effect a little bit more clearer. You'll see that, you know, bubble dynamics is a very complicated process. Um, You've got bubbles of all different sizes. They're not necessarily spherical. They change shape as they rise up through the bioreactor. They can coalesce, they can break up. So this A is a complicated thing, but luckily this A always comes with the KL. So you can think of these as not like two separate parameters at all, but a single uh, parameter. So if we divide across there by the VL, we're going to get TCL dt is KLA into CL star minus CL, where the little a there is just the big A divided by the liquid volume. So what this means here is that we, we identify this whole thing here as a, a single parameter. We, we never really try to split the KL and the A and measure them independently. There's no need to because they always arise together. 
Of course, that hasn't stopped people doing PhDs on, on bubble size distributions and all that kind of stuff. And in fact, when I was a student, that was one of the things I really was interested in, and a lovely book called Bubbles, Drops and Particles. But but they're very complicated things. Um, and the fact that they come together with the KL most of the time is is a good thing because, you know, it, calculating the, the A on its own would be horrendously difficult. So that's our governing equation for mass transfer of a, a tank of, of water being aerated by air. And if you think back at your heat transfer notes, we had something really similar when we looked at um, the heating of a stirred tank of, of liquid with steam. We would have had dt dt is equal to ua over mcp into the t steam minus t of the liquid. So mathematically, um, this mass transfer process is identical to the heating of a stir tank. There's absolutely no difference in, in terms of the mathematics of the problem. Um, so if you do the integration on that, you, you get this equation, which is, again, you should look back on your heat transfer notes. You'll see we get a very similar thing, except instead of the KLA, we've got the, uh, we will have here, we'll have UA over MCP. So it's 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 good to see the connections between subjects sometimes. And I've said this to you lots of times that, you know, you don't have to learn off as much in engineering as you do in biology. There's there's so many themes in, in certainly in, in chemical and process engineering that keep coming up again and again. So you're not starting from scratch. This this should be recognizable to you if you've studied heat transfer. So you shouldn't be phased by it. It's it's identical mathematically. So again, what you would have done in the lab, you would have measured um, CL, which are electrode as a function of time and worked out this in your spreadsheet, plotted it against time and the slope would be the KLA. A similar way we some exam problems in heat transfer where we use it to work out the, the U value. Um, just to say that if you work through this, it's just a little bit of algebra for you. If you work through it, you'll get, if you want to express CL as um, an explicit function of time, then you get this. So this is what's called a first order response or an exponential response. So at t equal to zero, that becomes one. So the CLs cancel, CL stars cancel, and you're left with CL is equal to CL zero. At t goes to infinity, all that goes to zero. So CL is CL star. So the, the concentration curves upwards in a nice exponential shape where the slope is decreasing all the time until it levels off um, at CL star, technically. So ultimately, if you keep your aeration going uh, for long enough, um, you will get to, the, well, the water will become saturated, which is kind of what you'd expect. So you might just do you do a little exercise there for yourself. You could do it now, pause this video if you want, and, and see can you go from there to there. Just a bit of practice. So I've stuck in a little problem there for you to do. Just see can you work out the KLA from there. Um, so our KLA, because our time is in seconds there, our KLA will, will come out as um, inverse seconds. So the units of um, KLA are inverse seconds, or inverse time. And you can prove that to yourself by thinking that the KL has units of meters per second. And the A has units of meters squared per meters cubed because it's an area per unit volume. So the meters cancel and KLA has units of one over time, which it has to have since it's multiplying by time. OK, so I'll leave you to do that as a little exercise for yourself. Um, I just want to talk about one thing that um, some of you might have got data in the lab that instead of a nice exponential shape, what happened there? <laughs> um, instead of a nice exponential shape like this, um, you might have got a shape that might have been a little bit S-shaped. Um, and if you hadn't noticed that, what, how that manifests itself in terms of this plot is that very often, this plot doesn't go through zero. If you try to fit a curve, a straight line through your data, um, you often get an intercept on the y-axis that is, is not zero. And technically, 
this line here should go through zero. And certainly when I've run that lab over the years, uh, particularly uh, when we only have water in the tank and not cells as well, that when students do their log plot to get the KLA, um, there is a non-zero intercept. Uh, and there's a little bit of curvature actually in the log plot. Um, and, and that brings us to a really important point that's, that kind of transcends mass transfer. It's not really just a mass transfer thing. It's, it's about measurement in general. Um, and next year with Brian Freeland, you'll talk a lot about instrumentation and control. And when you want to control a process, um, for example, if you want to control your, your temperature for your bioreactor at say 28 degrees or whatever, you have to have instrumentation in place that is, is accurate, um, precise and responds quickly. And this will be more of an issue in, in chemical processes where if things fluctuate too much, they might cause you know safety issues through explosions or whatever. But you need to have instrumentation that that detects changes as quickly as possible. And if you think about how we measure the, the CL or the dissolved oxygen concentration, how does it work? Well, the, the way a dissolved oxygen electrode works is that oxygen has to if you look at the little probe you have, oxygen has to diffuse into the probe. The probe has a little oxygen permeable membrane on it. So the oxygen has to diffuse into the probe. This is the oxygen from the, the liquid, has to diffuse into the probe where it sets off an electrochemical reaction uh, and that's recorded and it's calibrated. So what the electrode is, is actually measuring is the concentration inside the electrode, not the actual concentration in the liquid out in the, the bulk of the bioreactor. And what that means is that you get this what's called a lag effect, um, that if the electrode isn't responding very quickly, at any given time, because of the fact that the solute has to diffuse across the oxygen permeable membrane, at any given time, the electrode is measuring what the concentration was in the liquid phase some time ago, not at that precise instant. So you get this lag effect. Um, and that can be important, you know, in terms of, you know, control systems where suppose it was really important that you kept temperature tightly controlled, then you wouldn't want your controller or your instrumentation to be detecting the temperature that it used to be a few seconds ago, particularly if that temperature is, is likely to lead to severe operational difficulties. So what that means then is you have to, if you really want to describe this process on um, a mass transfer from air into, of oxygen from air into water, you do have to take account of the fact that the electrode, the data you're recording is not the exact data at any given time. And I actually got a student to do a nice project on this. It was a lovely project actually, where she looked at, at lag times and related it to things like uh, fluid viscosity and agitation rate and aeration rate and that kind of thing. It's a really nice project. I might run it again next year. Um, but anyway, the, the combination of the fact that the electrode is lagging slightly behind the actual system means that instead of this nice elect, resp um, exponential response that represents truth, I suppose, this is what is actually happening. What you often, you will detect would be something a lot more complicated because you're measuring the concentration in the electrode and it turns out that it's more complicated than the, the simple explanation it has actually two exponentials one to do with the KLA and one to do with, with a thing called the, the time constant of the of the electrode which is a measure of how rapidly it responds so if you were to plot that out for various values of tau and KLA you'd get what's called an s-shaped curve um, so if any of you, if you want to look back on any of your data from BE272, and if you actually plotted your, your CL data, um, if you saw kind of an S-shaped type of curve instead of a nice exponential curve, or if your this plot here was a little bit curved close, went close to t equal to zero and maybe had a non-zero intercept, then it's probably likely that 
um, what you were seeing was the effect of the electrode. And you're most likely to see those effects when you have high agitation rates and high aeration rates. Because in that instance, the concentration in the bioreactor would be changing very rapidly and the electrode may not be able to keep up. So if, if you have your data at hand and if you're interested, have a look at your high agitation, because I think that's what you did, wasn't it? You measured agitation. Or you measured KLA as a function of agitation. If you look at, you're most likely to see these kind of effects um, at high agitation rates and high aeration rates. Okay, one of the things we'll do next year, which is a really lovely experiment, even if I do say so myself, um, which was really, I mean, it's a great experiment, but it's all down to David Cunningham, who did all the, the, the groundwork on this, and we've been running it for a good few years now, and it's, it's probably the best experiment we do in third year. Um, where over the course of a day we, we grow cells, yeast cells. Uh, we used to use just Baker's yeast last year. We used a thing called Cubromyces marxianus, which grows very quickly, um, probably too quickly in some ways, so we might have to slow it down. But when you have cells growing and they're using up a, using the oxygen, then the, the mass balance, if you like, for the process gets a little bit more complicated. And if you look back up here, where we just had air mass transferring into water, uh, this was our, our mass trans, or this was our mass balance, or this one here is better. So DCLDT, so that's the rate of accumulation of oxygen is equal to the, basically the mass transfer rate from the bubbles into the liquid phase. Now, if we have cells in there, the cells are consuming the oxygen as it's being added. So we get the rate of accumulation is equal to um, the rate of mass transfer from the gas phase to the liquid phase minus a thing called the OUR or the oxygen uptake rate. Um, and one of the things we do in the lab is we, we track over the course of a day where cells are growing. So we monitor the cell count um, and every now and then we measure the KLA. And, and there's a way of doing that even when you have cells in there. It's basically the same as as this method here, but yeah, it's it's the CL star has to be defined slightly differently. But we worry about that next year. But but it's basically that. And to measure the oxygen uptake rate, well, you can ignore this bit here. What we generally do is we turn off the oxygen at some point and turn off the air at some point. And what happens then is that the concentration, dissolved oxygen, oxygen concentration starts to drop because you're not transferring any oxygen to the bioreactor, but the cells are consuming it. And what we generally find is that over the course of the conditions we run it, this tends to be constant. So the CL drops linearly. So by measuring the slope of, of that decline in oxygen concentration, we can measure our, our oxygen uptake rate. And then what we do is we get the students to, to plot the KLA throughout the day and also the OUR, the oxygen uptake rate throughout the day, and try to relate any changes that we see to the change in cell concentration. And we generally find that the oxygen uptake rate is directly proportional to the, the cell concentration, which kind of makes sense. The more cells you have, the, the faster your cells are going to take up the oxygen. Um, the KLA, we tend to find scatters around a bit. There aren't many changes, but, um, it's there are a couple of things we've noticed slight upward trend in this and there's an explanation for that but it's always in general we don't see much change in KLA over the course of the day but the oxygen uptake rate is, is a nice trend so that's really a flying um trip through mass transfer and bioreactors I've, I've deliberately kept things not mathematical in mass transfer I don't know I mean Non, not numerical in mass transfer, I should say, because as I was saying to you before, it's mass transfer is complicated by the fact that there are so many units you can use for concentration, whereas temperature, it's, it's degree C or Kelvin, same thing really for heat transfer. But in mass transfer, you're dealing with, uh, you know, it, it could be kilograms per meter cubed, could be moles, could be a molar concentration, could be a mole fraction, could be a mass fraction could be a percentage saturation. So I, I don't want you to get bogged down in in numerical stuff. I just wanted you to get the basic um, a basic grasp of, 
of what's going on in, in a bioreactor. And really it's it's this equation here that is the key for mass transfer in bioreactors that the and often at steady state over a short period of time, the oxygen uptake rate will balance the the mass transfer rate. So you can technically calculate the oxygen uptake rate if you know the KLA, but you don't generally don't know the KLA at that point. So um, but with that understanding of simultaneous mass transfer from the bubbles to the liquid and simultaneous oxygen uptake rate um, is is really the core of, of mass transfer in, in biotechnology. And you you know, a lot of the stuff that chemical engineers would have learned about it around interfacial mass transfer and what have you are not so important for, for you guys. Uh, just to summarize, really, uh, so I didn't do it this year with, with your class because of obviously the COVID-19 situation. But one of the things I used to ask was, as the third CA was to get people to think creatively and maybe do a bit of research. Um, what are the factors that increase the rate of mass transfer in bioreactors? Um, now it's, and it's really important to distinguish between the rate of mass transfer and the mass transfer coefficient. So the rate of mass transfer is KLA into CL star minus CL. It's, it's not the KLA, this whole thing there is the rate of mass transfer, KLA into CL star. So if you think about it, you've essentially two ways of increasing your mass transfer rate. One is to focus on the KLA and the others to focus on the CL star. And what I used to do is get the students to maybe think creatively and come up with ways of, of um, enhancing either the KLA or the CL star. And I used to come up with really obscure but correct things like, you know, adding things that act as a kind of a oxygen sink within the liquid and what have you. But there are three main approaches. One, to increase the KLA, the, the normal way to do that is to increase the agitation rate. In other words, make the impeller in the bioreactor go faster. And the second is to increase the aeration rate. So pump more air in. Um, the normal ways, the normal for most bioreactors, you're kind of operating with whatever the volume of your reactor is, you put in the same volume of, of air per minute. into. The, so if you have a one litre reactor, the kind of norm would be to have one liter per minute of air going into it. But if you enhance your aeration rate, technically you will get um, increased mass transfer. And the second one is to increase CL star. And it turns out that the, the saturation concentration of oxygen in, in water um, increases with increasing pressure. And you kind of expect that pressure is trying to force things into a liquid phase. So, so you, by pressurizing the reactor, um, you can increase the saturation concentration. So they're, they're the three main ways of increasing mass transfer. There are a few other obscure ones that are kind of research, people have been doing research on, but, but they're the three main ones. Increasing pressure in a bioreactor means you've got to be a little bit um, careful about operation because anything under pressure has the potential to cause safety issues. I remember a few years ago, uh, one of our, our postgrads, who then became one of our lecturers, forgot to release the pressure on the bioreactor and opened up a fitting on, on the top plate and it flew up and it missed his nose by millimetres and smacked into the ceiling. And this was, so it was a, a projectile, a stainless steel projectile. If it hit him, he would have been killed. So you have to be a little bit careful with, with, with pressurising systems. Anyway, we're going to build on this next year um, in the third year labs when you do that experiment and also in fourth year then when we, we do, well, if you do the reactors course with me and then if you do 451 where we, we tend to go up to the scale of, of, or we do what's called a fed batch reaction, which is a little bit more complicated than a, a batch reaction. Um, but really this last lecture in terms of getting the grips with mass transfer is the most important one that you really can't afford to just park and forget it will come back in various guises over, over the next couple of years and and also the whole issue of instrumentation and control will come back next year in, in BE322 so it's you know this idea of response time and, and what have you Brian Freeland will, will cover so so that's it for the the content I have to put up solutions to last year's exams and I'll do that as soon as I can um, and then I'm really going to rely on you guys to get back to me and 
you know either send me questions or we can have a tutorial through zoom or um but it's again it's i'm not going to give a tutorial where we just all sit around looking at each other <laughs> with an awkward silence i need very specific questions that you have um i don't need to have do in advance you know but i you know if we do have a tutorial you have to be ready to to ask questions so we, we can discuss about how best to do that um, so you've lots to keep yourselves busy in terms of problem sets and um, I'll confirm the uh, date for the exam I have a date a provisional date you know, we're talking probably second week in May um, but I, I, I don't want to say anything until the, the timetable is finalized so and again the, the exam will be pretty much like the sample paper but the, the sort of longer questions I've they'll actually be a lot shorter than they were in the sample paper so and um, so best to look um, it's been a weird year but um, I think one of the good things about this is that a lot of the lectures have got the grips with, with technology so in future years we'll be able to put things like screencasts how to do excel calculations and all that stuff up on loop so i think the long term everybody's going to benefit from you know, from the sort of learning experience we've all had because I, I think it's definitely going to improve courses um, next year you know to, to incorporate a little bit more technology not just all technology but, but some technology i think is, is going to help your learning in future years Okay, so be in touch. I'll, uh, I'll I'll check in with you every few days or so, and just to remind you that I'm here and that um, if you need help, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. So it's what you have plenty of time. You have a month now before the exam, really best part of a month. So um, this is a module where you should be hoping to to boost your average. To be honest, you know, because it's. It's the thing about engineering. You can get a hundred percent in engineering, whereas it's tougher in biology. And mind you, you can also get zero, which is tough in biology too. But but you know what I mean. It's it's if you're a good student and you've done your prep, you should be doing well in this module. Anyway, all the best. I'm going to sign off now in the usual way. I'll be foostering around here for a few seconds. All right, bye.